I really do. I mean, people are surprised. We've had some visitors from out of town, some international visitors who think they're, you know, they buy into whatever stereotype they hear about Cleveland on TV. And then they're like, but these, there's so many beautiful buildings and there's so much great infrastructure. And my mother likes to point out that when she was growing up, Cleveland was what, like the sixth biggest city in America. It was. And when she came to D.C. for college, she went to Howard. When she came to D.C. for college, she remembers talking to folks from D.C. who acted like they were these big city folks and she was a country bumpkin. And it would turn out that they were from like not even D.C. They were from Maryland or whatever. And she'd be like, wait a minute, I'm from Cleveland. And she would sing this song. Oh, she just replied to me. She says, um, from 1971 to 1978, uh, East 126th Street, Buckeye Woodland area from about 1965 to 1971. We had new sewers put in there. <laughs> All right. Well, before that, when she was a kid, I'm um, 65 to 71. So um, she was born in 1960. Uh, she said the whole, is it whole, Huff? No, it's Huff. I know it's Huff. That's where the riots were, right? The right. Huff area, 1525 Crawford Road. Uh, yeah, that's where they grew up. Well, let me tell you, my family lived by Huff and Crawford. It was one of the many places that we lived when we were kids. It was like 21 different places by the time I was 17. And one of the places was on, um, on Crawford off of Huff. And we were, uh, uh, perhaps the, the only, um, family in, in the neighborhood that was not of color. Um, uh -huh. And uh, I, I remember it clearly, not only because of that, but because the, when the person rented to us, uh, my dad and I, was, we were desperate to find a place to stay. At that point, we had five kids and they only allowed two. So when the mm -hmm. landlord would show up, three of us would run down the back steps and hide, be and hide behind a parked car until the landlord left so that we didn't get oh kicked out of our, our upstairs apartment on Crawford Road. Yeah, I, that's I, was. Uh, so you were you were on Crawford. My my yeah. mother was also on Crawford, fifteen twenty yeah. five Crawford Road. Oh my god, that is wild. <laughs> that's that is so very funny. Well, it's a small world. Well, look, we we're do, we've done a kind of a cold open here, but for people who aren't haven't already picked up on it, I'm here talking with Dennis Kucinich, uh, once described as the boy mayor of Cleveland, also a representative of Cleveland's tenth district, and now running. Uh, for the House of Representative, again, for Cleveland's 7th District. Welcome to Bad Faith Podcast. Uh, thank you, Brianna. And I, I'm very grateful to have this chance to have a conversation with you about uh, this critical moment in, in, in our nation and in the world. Well, talk to me about why you feel like it is such a critical moment. You're someone, obviously, who has served for a very long time in various capacities in government before, but some might be asking, you know, you've you've done your time, you've you've served, you've served your duty to the public. Why do you feel compelled to run again now? I, I feel a great sense of urgency to uh, to speak out. And one way in which one can do that is to not just run for office, but to serve an office. For 16 years in Congress, I uh, I, I warned the country about getting into these wars. I led the effort against the war in Iraq. I led the effort against uh, war in um, uh, in in Libya. Led the effort against uh, any kind of war in Syria. Uh, led the effort to try to stop a war against Iran. On and on and on. I, I, did I go to Congress for that purpose? No, I went there to make sure that people had uh, decent housing, jobs, good wages, health care, education. Those are all staples of the lives of people in northern Ohio and across the country. That's why I went there to begin with. But then I saw all this money was being blown on wars and empire building. And so, you know, that I gave hundreds of speeches on the House of Representatives about how America should take a different direction. Well, since that time, I left Congress. I served from uh, 1997 until 2013, and then I was redistricted out. Uh, from that time until the present moment, America has continued on this path of, uh, of empire, uh, a, a war uh, with 800 bases and all, you know, many of them being activated in various ways. And we're at a moment where there's genocide occurring right in front of our eyes. And even the call for a ceasefire seems like it it's some heroic thing to do when it's not. It's just it's just a, a, a call for common sense. 
uh, and and for humanity. And, and I will tell you this, um, I, and I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels it, but it's almost the, the pain that one feels from seeing what's going on in the Middle East is so powerful, it almost makes being able to utter words about it, to describe it, in, inutterable. It, it, yeah. it, it's like there's a, a feeling that gets caught right around the heart, and it's hard to express it, how, how strongly one feels about the slaughter that's taking place, and how our nation, our beloved country, is playing a pivotal role in, 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 in furthering uh, genocide. And so, you know, if this was happening against any people anywhere in the world, I'd be speaking out and I have. But that it is happening to the Palestinian people, uh, there is absolutely no excuse for it to happen, for it to continue. And so I've, uh, uh, yes, I'm, I'm running for Congress. On the economic issues that stem from our country's commitment to endless war. Yeah, I, I really take to heart how you describe the kind of throat catching nature of the horrors that we continue to see uh, telegraphed by incredibly courageous journalists uh, out of Gaza. I had to report this morning uh, on my job at the Hill about the two month old that was confirmed as having died of starvation in Gaza, a child that was born into this conflict who never knew a moment of peace their entire lives and um, had to be wrapped in the tiniest white shroud ever and put into the ground in large part because not just of the choices that are being made by the Israeli government, but choices that have been made by the international community that have dramatically limited the amount of food and other aid that have been able to make it into Gaza and that could potentially could have saved this child's life. But I want to ask you this question. We came out of 2018 with a um, seemingly an embarrassment of riches in terms of how many progressives, self-described progressives, DSA-affiliated progressives, were elected into Congress in that cycle and the following cycle. And I think there was a lot of sincerely felt hope that if we elected enough people who ran on our progressive ideals, enough people who said that they believed in Medicare for all, who said that they had an adversarial approach to politics, who were these Justice Democrat candidates who were recruited and run specifically to challenge not just Republicans, but the Democratic establishment who too often are themselves complicit in both for, um, uh, foreign bad foreign policy um, choices and domestic policy choices, and that there could be real change as a result. And I think the observation many of us have ha has had is that Congress has changed them, or at least silenced them, more than they have changed Congress. So what do you say to folks who admire you and your record, but who are skeptical about your ability to make an impact once elected? Right. Well, let me address... Um the uh, first part of the kind of pressures that come upon uh, members, particularly new members. There, there are tremendous pressures to conform once you get inside the system. It's like, you know, the, um, the, the idea, you know, in the rhyme of the ancient mariner, there's uh, over the lintel, this entrance to a doorway, the words are, abandon all hope, ye who enter within. Mm -hmm. And for some people going into Congress, it's like that. You go in with the best of intentions, but then all of a sudden you get caught up in a group think. And it's very powerful. And it's very difficult to be in that environment and to stand alone because you're excluding yourself when you do that. And the same drive that causes people to run for Congress, affiliation, uh, connection with people, once you get in there, and you find if you have a difference of opinion, you get shut out. And mm. it's tough to negotiate that. Now, I, I did that, and I had my own way of doing it. And I was able to put together coalitions to, for example, uh, uh, stop the bombing of uh, Serbia in 1999, to uh, uh, stop the, uh, at least assert a case against the war in Iraq in 2002, uh, to uh, almost block the initiation of the war against Libya because of a coalition I put together. And see, this is where my strength is. I don't polarize. I just lay the facts out. I just call it as I see it. And, and I'm not interested in Democrat, Republican. To me, ideology 
is often used to avoid a deeper discussion about, about our human interests, about the things that connect us. Because I believe that that as human beings, there is an underlying unity that we're interconnected and interdependent in ways that are extraordinary. And when you uh, consider that, and then you move to a, a, a partisan infighting and, uh, and polarized thinking, us versus them, you're right at the threshold of the precursors of war. That's not where, that's not where my home is. My home is human unity. And as a member of the next Congress, and I, and if elected, I would be the only, quite possibly the only independent in the next Congress, no party affiliation, in a Congress that will be closely divided. And I think that the skills that I have, the people skills, the skills that come not just from here, but from heart, the skills that come from a lifetime of experience in government at all levels and of people experience, because it's about people. This, this is really about interpersonal skills. Those skills will be put to work as a practical matter. There needs to be somebody in Congress who has the ability to talk to both sides without judgment, with plain factual discussions. And I think I'm that that's who I am and, and that I can bring that to Congress. Uh, my website at kucinich.com uh, contains a number of the issues that are important that I'm speaking about. But I will tell you, Brianna, you just, you know, you asked the seminal question, and that is, so what difference could you make? And, and in this case, at this time, I, I can make a real difference precisely because I haven't engaged in the kind of polarization which has uh, created a house divided in the, uh, in the United States Capitol. So one one thing I'd say in response to that is you're obviously your record speaks for itself and you're obviously not Joe Biden. But it is worth noting that Joe Biden made this sort of an argument saying, I spent a lot of time in Congress. I, like you, entered Congress at a very young age, have a lot of personal relationships, with people who remain in Congress um, and that I'm well liked across the aisle. And I'm going to be able to use that ability to get more for the American people than other more polarizing figures, perhaps even folks like Barack Obama, for whom he was vice president, who for a number of reasons, both substantive and not, was a polarizing figure. But that doesn't seem to have been have played out in that way. And at the same time, it feels as though there's been a recognition by the Democratic Party that the very argument that they used to kind of push voters that weren't that enthusiastic about Joe Biden into voting for him hasn't returned results as they turn around and say, well, you got to vote for him again, despite the fact that there are now much bigger blemishes on his record, namely his support of the siege on Gaza. So I think more pointedly, people would love to hear from you what you what what you think is actually possible, not having an expectation that one man can change the world. I, you know, I wouldn't put that on anybody's shoulders. But there have been these moments, it seems, where because of the narrow margins in the House, smaller coalitions have the power to have a lot of outsized influence. And we've seen this a little bit with the Freedom Caucus, obviously ousting um, Speaker McCarthy and getting some non-trivial concessions in the process of doing so. So I wonder if you could speak specifically to what in an ideal world you would hope to be able to do through a coalition or singularly with a platform of being back in Congress. Um, you know, the, the central question that's raised by what you just said, in my view, is can one person make a difference? Is po or is politics just a hopeless mess? And it doesn't matter who's in there. This machine takes on a logic of it or illogic of its own, and it's moving uh, uh, in a destructive, continually destructive path. Uh, I'm going to share with you uh, a... Uh, a quote that has actually been very important to me in my political life, and this will explain how I believe not just me, any you know, any one person can make a difference uh, <clears throat> wherever one stands or takes a stand. But uh, in 1968, uh, Senator Robert Kennedy, whose campaign I was hoping to join uh, by uh, the Oregon primary, in 68, uh, he, he had spoken earlier in Johannesburg, uh, in Cape Town, rather, South Africa. And he was asked about the uh, condition then of apartheid. 
uh, they, you know, there's young people there saw this white senator come and tell them, well, you know, the world will change. The apartheid at some point will be gone. And uh, it it seemed like just empty talk. And so when he was challenged uh, on that, here was his response. He said that each time a man or, or a woman stands up for an ideal, uh, strikes out against injustice, or acts to improve the lot of others, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope. And crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples can create a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. One person makes a difference. Only one person can make a difference. Each time any one of us determines to take a stand, to stand up and speak out at a critical moment, we have the ability to change the world. And as each one of us chooses, so chooses the world. We, we, we grew up in a culture where people are told, well, it doesn't matter. You know, everybody's like this. We're just keep continually shrinking in our, in our ability to change things. No, we have enormous ability to change things. And that's part of what we have to do to get the word out on campuses, to get the word across the country. People are feeling beat down. They're beat down economically. They, they are feeling powerless. This is really a, a moment for empowerment. And if I can do anything in this campaign, it's to help share the sense of empowerment that I have felt. I have seen so many incidents where people would tell me, oh, there's nothing you can do, Dennis. And I got in the middle of something. I was able to save Cleveland's municipal electric system years ago able to help save hospitals, save a steel mill, save fire stations, libraries, on and on and on, when others said, there's nothing you can do about it. We have to view the world anew with the courage of our hearts, with the belief that, that anything is possible and, and not be dissuaded by the, the prophets of doom and gloom who tell us, well, this is the way it is and will ever forever be. So, you know, that is the, the, the uh, foreground and the background of what animates me, a, a, a firm belief, and having seen how change can occur. So can we stop this war? Yes. Must we? Yes. Must there be a ceasefire? Yes. Must there be a way to repair this breach that has occurred in the Middle East where, where the, the Palestinians are being murdered and where Israelis have been murdered too? How do we stop this in, in turn us in warfare? Well, first, we have to believe the capacity to do it and to communicate with both sides. And I, and I have the ability to talk to both sides. So what's, what's so interesting is that I sometimes I, I ask a question like that, and I think it comes across like I'm saying that people are without hope, that they're despondent, that they're disaffected, when quite the opposite. I think that what I'm trying to articulate, perhaps poorly, is that people are not broadly despondent or disaffected but that they are specifically skeptical of electoral politics as a means forward. So I would completely agree with you that there are people who are very much invested in maybe it's labor action, um, whether they're invested in direct protests. Um, we've seen that Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, these people can't go anywhere these days without getting shouted down about uh, their complicity in Gaza. I think that's a very good thing. Um, there are folks that are very invested in boycott, divest, and sanction movements and the like, and are working very hard um, to try to figure out a way to influence the president. This abandoned Biden campaign that's happening in um, Michigan that has the support of Rashida Tlaib. And now some more mainstream figures like Beto O'Rourke is another example of ways that are set up outside of electoral politics to potentially move the needle. But I think what has been so kind of polarizing is in the word, it, what, what has radicalized folks is after having committed to, let's say, the Bernie campaigns in 2016 or 2020. I was the national press secretary for Bernie, right? I certainly was very much a believer myself. Have seen people like Bernie, who we very much admire, ultimately tell his supporters to vote for Joe Biden, ultimately decline to call for a ceasefire in this moment, despite doing some very important um, things like calling for 
the United States to follow the lay law and actually uh, not send weapons and funds to people who are committing humanitarian offenses. I, I don't want to take that away from him. But still, there does seem to be these there just seem to be these very bright red lines that the existence of the Democratic Party, the fact of the Democratic Party seems to impose on even the most well-meaning people who exist within it. And your choice to run as an independent in some ways could be read as a nod toward that reality about the intransigence of the Democratic Party and the structural barriers to moving it from the inside. And so I wondered if you could speak to that and perhaps framing it. Uh, uh, within your choice to run as an independent now when you previously served as a Democrat? Uh, Brianna, uh, you know, I, I came to a decision to run as an independent for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, I, I've never been into groupthink. I mean, even within a party, I was an outlier in terms of uh, on, on these major issues of war and peace, I was always willing to challenge the leadership of the party wherever necessary, uh, and I did so. And I, I did so without venom, but very directly. Uh, in addition to that, I mean, my spirit is 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 independent. I, I the, the, this whole categorization that partisan affiliation. Um, uh, brings is for me a straitjacket. I, I, it's an ideological, a spiritual straitjacket. It, it's. I think that we're at in an era where the political parties, because they haven't really, it's not a dialogue anymore. It's more of a uniparty. That there's, uh, they're failing to address the practical aspirations of the people anymore. It's all inside baseball. So I, I've looked at at the Democratic Party. And I, I've been very concerned about the fact that they have not uh, been speaking out against these wars, have funded, have funded them in various ways. Uh, I'm concerned about the alignment that the party struck years ago with Wall Street uh, that resulted in uh, the Democratic Party relying on some of the titans of Wall Street to fund, fund uh, their congressional campaigns. Uh, but beyond that, to talk about me personally, the 7th Congressional District, 47% of the voters are non-affiliated. Uh, I have always had the ability to reach across the aisle. So my support comes from Republicans, Democrats, Independents. And because of that, I am, you know, I might be in a rather unique position. Uh, again, people that don't polarize, I reach out, I, 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 I make, I, I try to build bridges in all directions. And as a result, I, I, I'm in a position, I think, to uh, return to Congress, uh, truly independent, but able to work with people on both sides of the aisle, I, which I've done in the past. So, you, you know, I, it's, for me, it's a practical thing, uh, but it's also meeting the moment where people are looking for individuals who think outside the box, who aren't constrained by the the you know the woof and warp of party uh, thinking, and and again, uh, groupthink leads us into war. Groupthink produces genocide. Groupthink uh, can put us on a threshold of a nuclear war. Uh, groupthink's a dangerous thing. And uh, our freedom as Americans depends on our ability to think freely and articulate uh, uh, our, our ideas in a way that may and should challenge the status quo. That's what I know how to do. How would you, if you were in Congress, vote on the bipartisan um, uh funding bill for both Ukraine and uh, Israel? Obviously, Last at the end of last year, Republicans insisted that there also be border funding attached to this bill for them to even consider it. And Democrats seemingly as an expression of how invested they are in passing this funding, how central it is and how important it, it appears to be for them, put together what many immigration experts describe as a quite uh, draconian, very uh, conservative border policy um, that arguably, if Donald Trump had put forward, would have resulted in marches in the streets and protest. Uh, Republicans reneged on their end of the deal and have 
um, held up, uh, have, you know, basically said uh, they, they're largely, uh, obviously there's factions, but the Freedom Caucus section of the Republican Party um, seems intent on holding this up, largely because it seems of the party's resistance to funding Ukraine, less so because of any kind of principled consistency as applies to Israel. I wonder what you make of those dynamics as they've emerged. Well, the, the minute that you start to throw all these different major issues into the same uh, bill, you're creating inertial factors that may be almost impossible to overcome. So the first thing that one would argue for is to have a clean up or down vote on each topic. Uh, that, that's what makes sense. Once you start to combine, and, and you know, this is all a matter of the Rules Committee. It's up to the Rules Committee to determine what's in a bill or what is permitted to be amended on the floor. And unfortunately, by putting all these issues in the same uh, pot, it's making it very difficult to come to any conclusion uh, in any way. Let me take them uh, separately. Uh, each. Please. Uh, first of all, with respect to Ukraine, look, I, I represented for 16 years a Ukrainian community in Cleveland. You know, Ukrainians are firmly committed to democracy. They, they you know, they they love democracy. They, they, they and, and I do join them in, in detesting this war that Ukraine has been dragged into. Uh, unfortunately, we, you know, with the help of some neocons in our own country who interfered with the internal politics of Ukraine, who wouldn't give Ukraine the ability to, to manage its own destiny economically in 2014, wouldn't let you people, professionals in Ukraine, go th to other places in Europe seeking work that would uh, reflect their area of expertise. And uh, when the Ukrainian government took a stand on this, uh, the United States uh, did what it could to, uh, uh, and did successfully help overthrow the government. And then Ukraine was used as a pawn. Uh, and the Ukrainian men and women, the flower of the youth of Ukraine, was used uh, to uh, try to continue this path of, of encirclement that came uh, from, from the thinking and dealing with the old Soviet Union, now uh, more uh, recently with Russia itself. And it was it was drawn into a geopolitical pose uh, that then resulted in policies where uh, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk were under attack. Uh, Russia uh, was drawn in by virtue of its constitutional responsibilities. Uh, I do not take any, give Russia any exception for any Ukrainian, a single Ukrainian was killed. But we have to understand how this thing came to be. And the United States has played a role in fueling this. And it's played a role that's actually worked against our interests. Because Russia is stronger economically, despite all these sanctions. Russia has been able to survive economically, despite the blowing up of the pipeline. The United States has undermined its support in Europe. The United States has helped to build a coalition against it with Brazil, Russia, India, uh, uh, China, and, and, and South Africa. Our whole foreign policy is a mess. And what's happened in Ukraine is part of it. That war should have been over a few years ago. There was a peace deal on the table that was scuttled with the help of Boris Johnson and others that would have given Ukraine uh, a, an opportunity to uh, to restore itself and to rebuild. Some of the best agricultural land in the world is in Ukraine. And yet we've seen uh, the destruction going on in Ukraine uh, that is is horrific. And, uh, you know, Russia's part of it. The United States is, too. And this this big power competition, which is primarily military and somewhat economic, we have to stop this. This is this idea that we're going to continue to build an empire and that somehow we were going to displace the government of uh, Russia is folly. And and it should be recognized as such. That, that war should end today. And, and the way you end it is stop providing more arms. Now, with respect to Israel, look, if Israel and Israel is committing genocide, we shouldn't be funding that, period. Sorted. Uh, and with respect to the border, I, I can tell you, I you know I have been a champion for people to be able to come to this country from all over the world, and you know everybody in my family going back generations came from different places. That you know very few 
uh, people in America can today can say that they were native, uh, and we know what happened to our native peoples. But I will say that, hey, we have to seal the border right now. We have to take stock of where we are with our immigration policy. Just an open border is not a policy. It, it can be the end of America if we are not uh, a, a cognizant of who's coming into the country, of why they're coming into the country, of of what you know what they're bringing to America. Uh, the Biden administration is, is made a shambles of immigration, and so I don't support those policies. Do you think the contemporary border policy is an open border policy? Well, it's de facto or open border. I mean, it's just, you know, there's when you have millions of people are able to uh, come into the country. But it goes, you know, we have to we have to back up to, before we have that kind of a discussion, which is why are people leaving their country of birth? You know, there's dynamics going on there that the United States should be taking note of and seeking to ameliorate instead of uh, looking the other way and pretending that, you know, we just keep our hands off until people arrive at the border and then uh, we decry any responsibility for them once they pass the border, which is is crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I'm reading this book right now and hope to have the author on as a guest soon. His name's John Washington. He He wrote a book that's actually the case, the affirmative case for open borders. But one of the points he makes very early on in the book is that for the majority of certainly global history, but also the history of the United States of America, there really has been something more akin to an open border policy. He points out that the overwhelming bulk of all walls that have been built, all border walls and barriers that have been built, have been in the very recent um, history. And that a, a better understanding of people's seasonal migratory patterns used to not just be understood, but actually embraced by, frankly, a lot of more conservative corporate interests precisely because of the benefit to dampening labor power, frankly, in the United States of America. I mean, there's been a kind of interesting reshuffling that's happened of late where right. it is it is simultaneously true that there are unprecedented number of numbers of people crossing the borders um, as compared to historically. And also true that it seems like the the response isn't to say, one, let's look at how what is causing the larger number of people to want to leave their homes, including what American policies are involved there, and also whether or not there should be an effort to actually fund the immigration processing system, including funding more administrative law judges and the like, so that those asylum claims can be actually processed instead of throwing out our immigration standards and the asylum process that we historically have been so proud of as Americans. Yeah, I well, let, let me uh, first of all zero in on what I think is uh, is one of the most critical areas to discuss with respect to uh, the millions of people who have come across the border without uh, having to go through the process that so many other uh, millions have had over over the years. Cheap labor. You know, these big corporations in this country, whatever whatever they're making or whatever, and some smaller ones, have a ready supply of cheap labor where people are ready to work for next to nothing. I mean, when I was in Congress, I had, it was not unusual to hear stories of uh, of groups of people who came in from Central America who would work for a month and then uh, be turned in by the company they work for, be turned in immigration and then deported so people would save the uh, the money that uh, uh, that they were had promised the workers. I mean, workers are exploited. They aren't organized. They're working for next to nothing. They're undermining. Uh, you know, you could say, well. Uh, they're taking jobs that Americans don't want. That's not not necessarily true. And you know there is there is a great deal of exploitation that that, that this whole uh, cycle of of unregulated, if you'd call it that, uh, movement into the country uh, is uh, is is part of. So I I'm very concerned about that. And you know there's all when you think about 
the concerns that people in the constituency that I've repre that I represented for 16 years and hope to represent again, people had their jobs offshored by rotten trade agreements. They uh, uh, their wages were depressed as a result. Uh, it's only recently we've seen some of the big unions fight back and try to at least establish a higher tier for the present workers. The ones that come in later may have a difficulty. You know, the, the, the cost of labor is a big issue here. And international corporations have sought to lower it from abroad uh, by offshoring our, our, our major industries. And part of the immigration and keeping these borders, uh, quote, open, is also about uh, a quest for cheaper labor, and and I'm not I, I'm not for cheap labor. I, I people need a, a decent living. They they need to be able to support their families, and we're not we're finding it very difficult today with the cost of housing going up. For example, uh, uh, that we are and and with the impact that inflation's having on family budgets, people are desperate for decent paying jobs. And when you let millions of people into the country are willing to work for just about nothing as compared to what they were, you know, what they would otherwise make in, in their country of origin, it's just not fair. And it undermines confidence in government. I can promise you that it undermines confidence in government. I don't have any interest in minimizing or sort of gaslighting folks into the idea that there isn't a surge of immigration at the border and that there are a lot of humanitarian reasons to be concerned about that, including, and I would say principally, the conditions in which immigrants are living as they endure that arduous border crossing and also once they make it to America. But as I'm sure you're aware, the rhetoric around the millions of undocumented people that exist in the United States is largely ignores the difficulty of legally attaining citizenship, the long wait times to be processed because of the lack of support to our administrative law system that processes and has to figure out which are legitimate asylum claims and which are not. And moreover, the the discourse seems wholly unconcerned with some of these, I think, very important moral questions that are only going to be increasingly important as environmental crises create millions more environmental refugees and America remains one of the world's largest producers of greenhouse gases. When our foreign policy and our drug policy creates the conditions for so much disruption in other parts of the world, when our sanctions create the conditions for so much disruption and immigration from other parts of the world to our own. And are we still going to be making the same kind of arguments about the border when we are facing people who are fleeing as a consequence of not being able to secure water, food, basic human resources in other parts of the world. At what point do we have an ethical obligation as a member of a global community to say that, frankly, and this is, I know this is a kind of a provocative question, America first is simply not an ethical position, especially when America is in so many ways the cause of the immigration, the root cause of the immigration in so many instances. Well, if by America first, you mean America with the military might to rule the world, I don't buy that. But if by America first, you mean that we, we address the wealth inequities that have come up in, in America fairly recently, where three people have the same amount of wealth as 170 million Americans. Yeah, we, we Americans ought to be first in terms of, of equity, in uh, income, a chance to survive financially. Uh, if we, you cannot look at the current immigration crisis, at the movement across the border, without looking at the underlying economic realities that are facing present day Americans, just trying to survive. Uh, where, for example, housing in the last decade, uh, it would take 21% of your income 10 years ago to be able to uh, afford a house and median income. Today it's 41%. I mean, how many young people can even afford a house anymore? And this isn't switching the subject, Brianna. You, we've got to have an understanding of the, of the underlying economics that are affecting the American people, which makes people more resistant 
to saying, well, just, you know, come on in. No, I'm with you. But are immigrants the cause of the rise, the steep rise in housing costs? No, not at all. I mean, that's a, no, not at all. But but it's it is the the underlying economic realities that Americans are are facing cause people to be less sympathetic to uh, the difficulties that others are have coming into America when there's a feeling like, look, let's take care of our people here. Let's and and so let me extrapolate that into one of the thematics of my campaign, and that is that we shouldn't be spending money all over the world on these wars with these 800 bases and 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 trying to dominate uh, the politics of the world for our military. Let's take the resources that we'd otherwise spend and spend it back here at home. Let me give you an example. In uh, uh, Brown University uh, did a, uh, one of one of their uh, study groups, the uh, uh, Watson, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, group, did a study saying that of the amount of the deficit that we have right now, $34 trillion, $8 trillion of that was added by the wars since 9-11. Now, mm-hmm. Americans don't understand how our freedom, uh, our, our political freedom, our economic freedom, even our constitutional freedoms are are in, are going through a winnowing process that results in a destructive undermining of our way of life. We're, we're ending up serfs to war. And so when you look at the realities that Americans are facing today, and then someone says, well, you know, keep the borders open, people are going, what? Wait a minute. I'm saying, let's take care of things here at home and stop the wars, take down the 800 bases, start addressing problems here at home. Because people have this awareness that they're, that there's a, there's a very, our, our economy is shaky and that uh, there's a false bottom and there's an erosion that's going on and that people's whole lives can change in a moment. And our government is looking abroad for dra- dragons to slay and we're not taking care of things here at home. That's yeah, the reason I, why. Yeah. Go ahead. I think the worry is when you first started talking, uh, responding to this question and you talking about America first and asked, well, if America first means that there are three people in the country who make more money than the or have more wealth than the bottom 50 percent. You know, I obviously agree with that sort of a framing, but that's exactly why I have concerns about the emphasis on the border. I'm not saying that you're emphasizing that, but it certainly is a national emphasis right now. There is a reality of an escalation of border crossings. At the same time, I would agree with your formulation that the real enemy in that equation has nothing to do with the immigrants. It's the three Americans who have more wealth than the bottom 50%. And given that we have, frankly, historically low unemployment, and given that you have Republicans trying to um, change child labor laws in, in 16 states, I believe it is, across the country to try to depress labor power um, in light of um, their countervailing efforts to close down the, the border, it does seem to me that the target can be easily misplaced. And as much as there are these candidates and politicians who will, especially on the right, who will characterize their opposition to foreign wars as a desire to spend money at home, they, as you, I'm sure, are well aware, will turn around and vote down any domestic spending efforts at the same time. So I am cautious about that rhetoric and the way that it is deployed. And to that end, I I do feel compelled to ask you a little bit about your most recent role as the campaign manager on the RFK Jr. campaign. RFK Jr. was very interesting to a lot of people on the left precisely for those reasons, for having a more non-interventionist approach to Ukraine um, because of his long record of environmental advocacy and because you know, after obviously campaigning first as a Democrat, he decided to campaign as an independent, which, as you've articulated for yourself, has a certain kind of appeal, especially for anti-establishment members of the left, as well as the right. However, I think what turned off a lot of people on the left was were his comments about Israel before October 7th, and even more acutely after October 7th. Notably, very different position than you've articulated here and that you've articulated over your long and illustrious career. So I wondered if you could speak to that and whether or not 
his uh, that kind of political stance had anything to do with your choice to to leave his campaign? Uh, first of all, uh, Bobby Kennedy's a friend of mine. I've known him for 30 years. Uh, he came to Cleveland and met with uh, uh, my wife, Elizabeth, and I uh, over a year ago and told us that he was uh, looking at, at running for president. Uh, I you know, told him, look, if, if you are, let me know. I'd be glad to help. What can I do? He says, well, I'd like you to manage my campaign. Uh, the... We go into a campaign with uh, a certain uh, implicit understanding of what you know an individual may stand for, and uh, and Israel doesn't have a stronger supporter than Robert F. Kennedy Jr. I can tell you that I've saw I've seen him uh, uh, smeared as an anti-Semite. Uh, wrongly and how he has um he has a firm commitment and i i i understand that uh the differences that uh, arose in the campaign which caused uh uh us to go our separate ways although we're still friends uh had to do with a number of factors uh one of which was his his choices on foreign policy uh i'm i'm not uh i'm not the kind of person that you know i look at someone and that i'm trying to help and i'm saying well you know it's my way or the highway i, I don't do that but but i have to look at the entire arc of of things uh some of which might be issue which were issue related but others were just the uh, you know the way the uh can campaign was being conducted and none of this is sent as being, you know, critical of my friend uh, Bobby Kennedy, uh, but it said that I I made my choice, and uh, shortly after leaving the campaign, I thought that I might still be able to make a contribution by uh, attempting to return to the United States Congress and staying true to my own uh, inner compass to run as an independent. But you know, I'm uh, again. Uh, but Bobby Kennedy has uh, has a lot to offer, uh, but I'm not involved in that campaign anymore. I'm not involved in any presidential campaign. I am not speaking on behalf of any other candidate. I'm running uh, on my own merits or, or lack thereof, depending on other people's views. And um, that's kind of where it's at with me, Brianna. Yeah, I don't mean to put you... I know it's a sensitive situation, and I really appreciate... Um, your answer. Selfishly, I, I would say that I think uh, many of us on the left, despite our frustrations with electoral politics, would like to see ourselves represented in these races. And I know how difficult it was, both from working on um, Bernie 2020 and from having some conversations with some of the left candidates. We've kind of seen Cornell West go through this, trying to find qualified campaign managers and um trying to find a, a good home a party a, 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 in terms of the party they belong to or the non-party they belong to, that is legitimately difficult. It's not easy for, for insurgent candidates, for outsider candidates. And so when you have someone like yourself who has so much experience in politics and also such a consistent and valued record as a progressive during moments in time when it was in no way easy, selfishly, there was a part of me that hoped that you would be attached to a left presidential effort that maybe didn't come, you know, again up against some of the roadblocks that were presented by what seems to be RFK Jr.'s deeply felt commitments to an, the state of Israel. Um, and selfishly, you know, I, I, Marianne's campaign, for example, had its troubles, but I remember when she was hunting for a campaign manager, and I would have loved to have seen you and her or Cornell West or whomever aligned, um, because it is very difficult to find people like you who know what they're doing and have run all these kinds of campaigns and also have consistent politics that are genuinely rooted in the left. Well, you know, first of all, thank you. And and let me say that, look, I, I've run for president twice. Both times I ran to challenge the wars that uh, the country was embarked on. 
I, I did that because I saw the truth of what was happening. In 2002, I, I wrote a memo that I distributed to hundreds of members of Congress that you could you could go right now on the internet and type in uh, Kucinich Tarak uh, memo, October 2nd, 2002, and see that I had chapter and verse, everything that was wrong with that war. It was very easy to see. Now, when no one was paying attention, I thought, well, I'm going to run for president and, and force people to look at this. And I did it again in 2008. Uh, you know, I actually thought about it uh, for 2024. Uh, but then when uh, Bobby Kennedy uh, came up, it, to me, it's never been about me, ever. It's about yeah. what kind of world do we have? And so when he said, well, you know, I'm going to give it a try as as a Democrat, I thought, well, OK, let's see. And we looked at it and gave it a try. Uh, but there were so many barriers put up by the DNC, it was almost impossible. Uh I think to me, you know, wherever I'm standing, you know, the uh, I think it was uh, our committee said, if you give me a place to stand, I can I can change the world. Uh, Congress is a place to stand. A presidential campaign is a place to stand. Uh, and, and the stand that I take now is to say, you know, stop these wars. Stop, stop you know, first of all, ceasefire. Stop the genocide. But stop all these wars. Come home, America. Take care of things here at home. Deal with this thirty-four trillion dollar deficit, which works out to about, I don't know, since uh, about ninety-seven thousand dollars for each uh, American family of four. I, 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 I fear for my country. I, we're losing this country. We're losing it to lies uh, that put us into war. We're losing it to. Uh, financial manipulation, where the wealth is accelerating upward. We're losing it to our personal freedoms that are being lost with the uh, 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 with the cooperation of big tech and big government. I, you know, we're everything that every all the familiar markers of what it means to be an American are starting to. There's a distortion that's going on, and each new generation is losing an understanding of what the country ought to be about instead of this miasma that we're projected into because of, of the fear and the warmongering that we see happening from every direction. Would it be safe to say, well, let me not ask a leading question. Would you support a candidate, a third-party candidate, assuming that Joe Biden, because of the absence of a Democratic primary, is the Democratic nominee, despite the concerns about um, the spoiler effect and what Democrats have characterized as the existential democratic uh, democracy threatening issue of Donald Trump potentially being reelected? Well, if we have war, no matter who wins, who's the spoiler? <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm running for Congress. I am not running in any other with any other campaign. I, I'm running on my own merits on a on a, on a history of uh, of uh, of service to the people, on a record of standing up and speaking out. Uh, I'm I'm not going to be involved in other, any other campaign uh, because uh, otherwise um, I would uh, I, it would be antithetical to really being not aligned. Because in Congress, I want to be in a position where I can look at both sides and say, look. Let's reason together. Let's find a path forward and be a, uh, a moderator and a convener in a way that doesn't tear people up and says, look, here's the best path forward for America. This is about to me, this is about America. And, and you know, be, before be, before we're done or something, there's something that that I want to say, uh, because I, I want I want your viewers to know that I recognize something. You know, mm. the media is a very tough place to be these days, particularly if you have a, a an informed point of view that challenges the status quo. And, and I'm not just saying this because you invited me on, but I want to say it, otherwise I'd feel that I was remiss in not saying it. But you have demonstrated a, a, a courage that is is uncommon in, uh, in, in the media, and you've demonstrated a compassion, which is very tough to hold when there are are people who are trying to say, well, he did this, he did that. No, you're you you're looking at a, a 
at a at, at, at humanity from a uh, a point of view that is elevated and trying to get above it all to say here we are as human beings and you know there's an intellect that goes with that that I admire and I appreciate this chance to have a discussion with you because it it is a discussion and it's and it's an important one for me to hear what you're saying but also I think hopefully for the audience that is is watching this to be able to understand that you can have a discussion and maybe have some you know variances of how you look at the world and do it in a way that's straightforward and respectful and that comes from a place of uh, heart and end of head well Dennis Kucinich, I'm very humbled um by that compliment and I, I truly am so grateful that you took the time to talk with me here today and I, I find myself in this position often on the podcast where I'm rooting <laughs> you know I'm rooting for the guests and I'm asking the questions that I know my audience wants to hear so that they can feel comfortable rooting for the guest or supporting the guest, whether financially or in some other kinds of ways. And when I ask that last question, it's largely because I do know that so many people in the audience have been frustrated, not by just the fact that, let's say, AOC, you know, no one's expecting her to get into office and snap her fingers and then there's Medicare for all. But they do, for example, expect her to keep talking about Medicare for all. They do expect her, for example, to not have morphed from someone who, when she was running, said, in any reasonable world, Joe Biden and I would not be in the same party, which seems like a not especially controversial and very accurate thing to say. We were in a kind of a more uh, European multi-party um, situation. They're, they shouldn't be in the same party. To being someone who almost immediately endorsed Joe Biden with no commentary at all about the absence of a Democratic primary, despite widespread serious concerns among the Democratic base about his cognitive fitness, about uh, the genocide in Gaza and a number of other substantive issues. And so I do just want to, I did just want to give you an opportunity to speak to some of the ways in which people might hope or in which you might act differently than some of the elected progressives already, including giving you an opportunity to say if you would have behaved differently um, around a moment like forced to vote and voting for a speaker like Nancy Pelosi or Hakeem Jeffries now, um, would you be willing to uh, pull a move like the Freedom Caucus pulled and try to use your leverage with a small number of other people, whether they're Democrats or Republicans, to force meaningful changes? Like the like Republicans, like the House Freedom Caucus, pushed for single up-down voting, for instance, on bills that would help to clarify people's positions on things and avoid grandfathering bad bills through with good ones. I mean, that's that's all I've been trying to really get at and to give you an opportunity to speak to people's, I know, deep concerns that, frankly, it's an impossible task working within the Democratic Party. Just as RFK Jr. discovered as he ultimately left the Democratic Party and, and a move that I think a lot of us were like, oh, we told you so, right? We could have we could have predicted this. And same with Marianne. Well, I, you know, I, impossible. I, I look at it this way, that for me, it's more possible to be an independent. Uh, I can work with both sides of the aisle. Uh, I, I want to go back to my uh, my my motivation and what's what's driving this campaign because I I believe if I'm if I'm if I'm elected in Ohio's seventh district, an area by the way that almost forty five percent of it I've represented for sixteen years. I've uh, I'm a familiar face and a familiar uh, political commodity to people. And also familiar service, because we handle like 11,000 cases a year. Whenever people needed help, they came to our office. Uh, but my my thinking is this, that as an independent, if elected, I, I could very well be the only independent in the entire House of Representatives, closely divided House. And you used the word leverage before. And there would be great leverage in that, that I certainly would be willing to use on behalf of peace, on behalf of economic justice, on behalf of freedom, on behalf of of, of, a, of, an, of an America that everyone would, would be truly proud to pass on to the next generation. Uh, we, I, I think, I think, you know, this is a capacity, it's a gift that I have that I want to return to public service. And it's okay, however people want to vote me up or down, but to me, it's important to be here to take a stand for people to know that their individual is ready to step forward 
with the knowledge and the integrity and the ability to uh, uh, to speak the truth and to lay it out, because I have a record people can look at, and you will see on matters of war and peace, I have been right 100% of the time over the 16 years that I've served in the House. And so I'm I'm taking that same capacity, hopefully offering it, yeah, and offering it to the people in the 7th District. Uh, if you go to kucinich.com and you want to help in any way, shape, or form, I welcome uh, people's participation. Uh, we're getting help literally from across the country because people see a unique opportunity here, and it is unique. Uh, do I, and again, goes back to what I said a while back, you know, I, I think I can still make a difference, uh, but I can't do it alone. And whether I win or not could depend on people who are watching this show because, um, uh, you know, the, we, every we're, it's all connected. It's all interconnected. We, 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 we stand for each other and hopefully we stand for a better America and a better world. Dennis Kucinich, thank you so much for being so generous with your time today. Very grateful for the opportunity to be in a conversation with you, Brianna. Thank you. Thank you. And to all you listening, take care of yourselves. And as always, keep the faith. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast. That's patreon.com slash badfaithpodcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.